Coming up on our newscast tonight. President Moon Jae-in presents his new Southern Policy Vision at the 42nd Singapore Lecture. It centers around the single economic community of the two Koreas, working to forge partnerships with Southeast Asian nations. North Korea and the United States agreed to meet on Sunday to resume talks on the repatriation of remains of U.S. troops after the regime's officials were apparent no-shows for scheduled working-level talks at Panmunjom. After more than a month of being inactive, the South Korean parliament shakes off the rust. Lawmakers kickstart things by electing a new assembly speaker. New Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. Once again, our starting point is Singapore. On day three of his state visit to the island nation, President Moon Jae-in outlined his vision and policy for peace and prosperity, something that should follow the inter-Korean summits and the historic meeting between leaders of Pyongyang and Washington. Our Chief Chinese Correspondent Moon Gon-young starts us off with the message during a special lecture held earlier today. In a city-state, which just a month earlier saw the leaders of North Korea and the U.S. come together for a historic summit, South Korean President Moon Jae-in laid out his vision and policy for lasting peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula, one as daring as the one he presented in Berlin a year ago. A single economic community of the two Koreas creating partnership for the future with Southeast Asian countries for people, co-prosperity and peace. This is President Moon Jae-in's new Southern policy, a vision that he shared at the 42nd Singapore lecture hosted by the Yusuf Ishik Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. The South Korean president also made sure to send out a message to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, a message of prosperity but with a premise. Kim Jong-un 위원장이 비핵화의 약속을 지킨다면 자신의 나라를 he vowed to do his utmost to establish a peace regime so that economic cooperation with the North could begin. But... This time of the year last year, President Moon stood in Berlin and spoke of peace. Peace in dialogue with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, when most people thought of it as impossible. A year later, here we are in one of the world's most vibrant market economies. President Moon is speaking of a new economic map on the Korean Peninsula, one that links the two Koreas. Where this will take us a year from now remains to be seen. Reporting from Singapore, Moon Gon-young, Arirang News. When President Moon took to the podium to deliver that message, his audience comprised of some of the most influential figures in that country. That stage, after all, is reserved exclusively for world leaders that can provide important viewpoints on major international issues. Kuruni fills us in on the significance of the Singapore lecture. Since 1980, more than 40 distinguished leaders around the world deliver their insights at the Singapore lecture. The speech is prepared by the Yusuf Ishik Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, which aims to nurture scholars and intellectuals in the country. At the Singapore lecture, the audience is offered with the opportunity to learn about the country where the speaker is from, including socio-political and economic trends, national security problems and environmental issues. Regular participants include members of the civil service, business community and academic field. In particular, the event has allowed young executives in both the public and private sectors to widen their perspectives. 
South Korean President Moon Jae-in, who delivered his remarks regarding peace on the Korean Peninsula on Friday, became the 42nd foreign head of state to meet the Singaporean audience. Moon is the second South Korean leader to stand at the Singapore lecture podium. The late former President Kim Dae-jung addressed the distinguished audience in 2000. Kim's lecture was about the importance in bringing peace on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. The late leader also explained the results of one of the biggest achievements during his administration, the first ever inter-Korean summit held in June 2000 in Pyongyang. Other notable speakers to deliver their insights at the Singapore lecture include Chinese President Xi Jinping, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and former French President François Hollande. Ko Arirang News. Well, in Singapore, President Moon also met with Korean nationals living in the city-state, giving them props for their contributions. He guaranteed the positive impact of the new Southern policy will be clearly felt. Hwang Ojun shares with us his remarks. President Moon said that his visits to India and Singapore served as an opportunity to raise South Korea's diplomatic relations to the next level. Those remarks came during his meeting with nearly 400 local Korean residents and about 50 Singaporeans who contributed to the friendship between the two countries. During the meeting, President Moon said the strengthened cooperation with Singapore will speed up the progress of his new Southern policy, Seoul's effort to boost cooperation with ASEAN to the same levels as it has with the U.S., China, Japan and Russia. He insisted such results will improve the livelihoods of Korean nationals in Singapore. President Moon praised the efforts of Korean residents in Singapore to maintain friendly relations between the two countries and expressed his gratitude for their strong support for the historic Pyongyang-Washington summit hosted in Singapore last month. President Moon pledged to boost cooperation with Singapore and work together in technologies linked to the fourth industrial revolution so that Koreans in Singapore working in those areas would not only strive but thrive. With that, President Moon completed his final public event before heading back to Korea after completing his six-day trip to South and Southeast Asia. Hwang Wojun, Arirang News, Singapore. Yesterday, Pyongyang and Washington were supposed to hold working-level talks on repatriating the remains of fallen American soldiers. But North Korean officials stood up their U.S. counterparts. Finally, we have some explanations on the no-show, and a new date is set Sunday, July 15th. Park hee has the full story. Officials from North Korea were expected to meet Thursday with U.N. command officials representing the United States to discuss repatriating the remains of American troops who went missing in action during the Korean War. Returning the remains was something North Korean leader Kim Jong-un promised to do when he met last month with U.S. President Donald Trump in Singapore, and it was considered a huge step forward in building trust between Pyongyang and Washington. Talks on implementing the agreement were due to be held on Thursday at the Chu's village of Panmunjom, as arranged last week in Pyongyang by U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and senior North Korean official Kim young chol the U.S. had already sent 100 wooden caskets to Panmunjom to carry the soldiers' remains back home once an agreement was reached. But North Korean officials never showed up. According to the U.S. State Department, the North contacted the U.S. side later in the day, offering to hold the talks on Sunday instead. Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, citing government sources, also reported that Pyongyang proposed holding them at the general level, strongly hinting that the North wants a senior U.S. military official present at the negotiations. Sources say North Korea made a direct call to the U.N. command through a line that was suspended for five years after North Korea called off the signing of a ceasefire agreement in 2013. Pyongyang is known to have asked for the military channel to be restored and, after it was restored, to have asked for understanding for the delay that was caused by its lack of preparation. The State Department accepted the proposal, and so the two sides will finally meet for their overdue talks on Sunday to carry out the agreement from the Singapore summit. Park Kijun, Arirang News. U.S. President Donald Trump revealed the letter he received from Kim Jong-un, most likely the one passed to him by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Oh Jong-hee zooms in on this unusual move of di disclosing its content to the world via Twitter, possibly to counter criticisms on lack of progress made on denuclearization. 
A matter of hours after the planned talks at Panmunjom fell through Friday regarding the return of America's war dead, President Trump tweeted out a letter he received from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Dated July 6th, it's believed to be the one delivered via Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who visited Pyongyang last week. Kim Jong-un writes that the June 12 summit marks the start of a, quote, meaningful journey, and he expresses appreciation for Trump's efforts to improve bilateral relations and implement the joint statement. He adds that the efforts of the two will lead to fruitful results and says he hopes the process of promoting relations will lead to their meeting again. Trump commented, a very nice note from Chairman Kim of North Korea, great progress being made. It is rare and unusual for presidents to reveal the letters they've received from leaders of other countries. In fact, it's regarded as a diplomatic discourtesy. But it seems Trump decided to reveal the letter to soothe criticisms of the outcome of the Singapore summit. Trump wants to show that he and Kim Jong-un are still close, and therefore the denuclearization talks are moving forward. But if you look at the letter, the word denuclearization isn't actually there. The North's negotiation tactics show that it prioritizes better relations with Washington over denuclearization. So questions remain about its denuclearization. Critics point out that there hasn't been tangible progress on the denuclearization front, though a month has passed since the summit. Kim Jong-un did not meet Pompeo during his visit to Pyongyang last week, and on Thursday, the North Korean side did not show up to the scheduled talks at Panmunjom. That's led to questions about Kim Jong-un's sincerity, despite the letter about implementing the summit agreement. Oh Jong-hee, Arirang News. Back here in the nation, a repatriation ceremony for fallen Korean war heroes was held this morning in Seoul. The event was held to mark the return of the remains of two soldiers who finally got to return home after more than close to seven decades. Park ji takes us to the scene. South Korea and the U.S. held a ceremony at Seoul National Cemetery Friday morning to commemorate the repatriation of the remains of two soldiers, one South Korean and one unidentified American. The South Korean soldier is Private First Class Yoon kyung hyuk presumed to have been killed in action in November 1950. His remains were discovered in North Korea during a joint recovery project between the U.S. and the North in 2001. The unidentified U.S. soldier was found in June 2016 at the location of one of the fiercest battles of the war in South Korea's Gangwon-do province. The remains were identified as an American soldier in 2017. At the ceremony, Commander of UN Command General Vincent Brooks said it is a solemn obligation to remember those who have fallen in battle or those missing in action. Today, two of our warriors are being returned to their countries and to their families after years of searching and finding and testing to determine identity. May this be the journey of all who remain missing in action or listed as a prisoner. I pray that this ceremony will bring a sense of closure to your family and that you will be comforted in knowing that they were honored appropriately. Seoul's Defense Minister Song yang mu said country's efforts to repatriate war remains could lead to a path of peace on the peninsula. Our efforts to recover remains of fallen war heroes won't be an easy path, but it will open another path towards perpetual peace. Currently, negotiations between North Korea and the U.S. are going on for repatriation of remains of U.S. forces. I hope someday South and North Korea can jointly work to recover war remains in the DMZ area. The director of the U.S. agency in charge of identifying and repatriating soldiers' remains said the efforts were a sign of the values of the U.S. and South Korea. The fact that the Republic of Korea and the United States are staunchly committed to find, recover, repatriate, and honor those who sacrifice their lives in the defense of liberty is a strong testament of our nation's shared values. Despite the significant numbers of missing and the steep challenges of the efforts, we persevere because we cannot forget their sacrifice nor the closure owed to their families. 
the remains of some 120,000 South Korean and 8,000 U.S. soldiers from the Korean War still haven't been recovered. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Two Russian military aircraft flew into South Korea's air defense identification zone today. According to Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff, the planes approached the Kadiz on the East Sea at 1.41 p.m. local time. Seoul immediately dispatched fighters to carry out a tactical response and broadcast warning. Moscow's jets entered the zone on the northern side of Ulungdo Island at 2.08 p.m. They moved in and out of the Kadiz before eventually flying away from it on the northeastern side of Tokdo Island at 5.53 p.m. South Korea's Defense Chief Song Young Moo held talks with U.S. Secretary of the Navy Richard Spencer. During their meeting held this afternoon in Seoul, they discussed ways to strengthen bilateral military coordination. The duo agreed that maintaining strong alliance and strengthening cooperation between the two countries are paramount amid the changes in security situation on the Korean Peninsula. They also saw eye to eye on the need to further develop bilateral military partnership. A group of North Korean athletes will cross the border on Sunday. They'll be competing in the 2018 Korea Open Table Tennis Competition in Daejeon. The team of 16 table tennis players and nine officials are led by Kim song yi the 2016 Olympic bronze medalist in the women's singles. The Korea Table Tennis Association will discuss with Pyongyang about forming joint squads in the men's and women's doubles for the competition. It's highly likely the ladies will compete as one since they already experienced playing together at the World Championships back in May. The North Korean team will return home on Monday, July 23rd. The nation's parliament convened an extraordinary session today that will run for the next two weeks. Bringing an end to over 40 days of inaction, rival parties started by electing a speaker and two vice speakers. Kim Min-ji has the latest from the domestic political arena. The latter half of the 20th National Assembly kicked off Friday with the election of the parliamentary speaker, a key post that had been vacant for over a month. In a plenary session, rival lawmakers elected Moon hee Sang, a six-term lawmaker with the ruling Democratic Party of Korea, as a new National Assembly speaker. It's been customary to give that role to the largest party. Moon was chosen as a ruling party candidate back in May. I promise that cooperation will also be prioritized over the next two years. It will be the ruling party's responsibility to work on bills related to reform and the people's livelihoods. They must not blame the opposition bloc, but at the same time, the opposition also needs to show sincerity in negotiations. They must make demands, but also make concessions when necessary. Moon will now lead the ruling party to become an independent in accordance with the National Assembly law and will be at the helm until May 2020 when the 20th National Assembly comes to an end. Two vice speakers were also elected, five-term lawmaker Lee Ju Young from the main opposition Liberty Korea Party and four-term lawmaker Chu Sung Young from the minor Padamita Party. With the leadership post now filled, it's back to real work. Next Monday, a plenary session will be held to elect the heads of the parliament's 18 standing committees. The ruling party will chair eight of them, the main opposition seven, the Padamita party two, and the joint bloc of the Party for Democracy and Peace and the Justice Party will head up one. The rival parties will also vote on a revision to the National Assembly Act that would create a separate committee for education, an area now subsumed by the Committee for Education, Culture, Sports and Tourism. Also on the agenda are confirmation hearings for the candidate for Commissioner General of the National Police Agency and nominees to fill three spots on the Supreme Court. The latter half of the 20th National Assembly has officially set sail, but things could get choppy for the rival parties as they try to make up for over a month of paralysis. For starters, lawmakers are expected to clash during the upcoming confirmation hearings, not to mention the pile of disputed bills that need to be reviewed. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. The government's latest economic report shows continued rise in industrial output and strong exports. But there are some concerns over the weak employment figures and the risk of collateral damage from the U.S.-China trade war. Won Jong-an help us look beyond the numbers. South Korea's economy has been on a steady rise for eight straight months on the back of a rebound in industrial output. According to the government's monthly Economic Green Book report, South Korea's overall industrial output rose 0.3 percent on months in May, following the previous month's 1.5 percent gain. 
The country's exports have exceeded 50 billion U.S. dollars a month for four consecutive months, despite rising oil prices and interest rate hikes in the United States. But the latest economic forecast highlighted increasing uncertainties stemming from a sluggish job market and a growing trade spat between China and the U.S. The number of newly added jobs still remains in the 100,000 range for five straight months in June, the worst it's been since last decade's financial crisis, keeping the employment rate at just 67 percent, unchanged from the same period in 2017. And uncertainties have increased over the trade conflict between the U.S. and China, Korea's two largest trading partners, and the impact that dispute could have on Korean exports. Won Jong-an, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the Bank of Korea released its data on the nation's export and import prices for last month. It showed both indexes are on a rise. Kim hye breaks down the digits for us. South Korea's import prices went up for the sixth consecutive month in June due to the weakening Korea won. The Bank of Korea says the import price index rose 1.3 percent on month, recording 88.26 in June. Compared to the same period last year, the index is up nearly 11 percent, marking the biggest jump in 17 months. The local currency weakened against the U.S. dollar, recording an average of 1,092.81 last month, pushing up Korea's import prices despite a slight fall in global oil prices. In particular, raw material prices went up 1.4 percent on month, or more than 26 percent on year. Without the change in the $1 exchange rate, the Bank of Korea says June's import prices would have ticked down 0.1 percent on month. Export prices edged up around 1 percent on month to 85.68, continuing its upward streak for a third consecutive month. The central bank attributes the rising export prices to an increase in industrial goods prices, including metals and machinery. Export and import prices affect future consumer prices, so this could mean higher inflation in the months to come. Kim hye Arirang News. It's almost summer vacation season here in the nation. Most take time away from work between late July and early August. A new survey suggests more than half of South Korea, some 60 percent, are planning to take a vacation during that time. The poll released Thursday was conducted by HUNET, a human resources consultancy. Plenty of people are skipping it, though, 16 percent, in fact. They cited financial difficulties, too much work, or plans to go on holiday some other time. The survey found respondents are planning a holiday that will be, on average, 4.3 days long. The cost around 530 U.S. dollars, some 15 percent increase from last year. Time to turn to Michelle back at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, I'm going to make a bold prediction. Coffee shops, malls, theaters, anywhere there's air conditioning is going to be packed with people this weekend. I know I'll be there for sure. Now the heat wave is only intensifying day after day, and so the alerts are being strengthened too. Now Seoul is currently under an advisory, but it won't be long until it turned into a warning just like the southern areas. More heat is coming our way tomorrow. The highs will be about 3 degrees higher than today. And elsewhere in the region, Beijing gets rain with thunder and Tokyo just about the same as here in Seoul. Not much relief from the temperatures at night either. Seoul begins the morning at 24 degrees Celsius, but most of the southern areas will be at 25, which is considered a tropical night. The daytime highs in Seoul rises up to 33 degrees, Gwangju 35, Busan hits 32 degrees. There's no rain nor wind to cool off the heat for the next couple of days. Now there's heat wave during the day and tropical temperatures at night, so try and find ways to stay cool throughout the whole day. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
That's all we could squeeze into tonight's edition of Arirang News Center. Wherever you may be tuning in from, hope you have an incredible weekend.